And we continue with habit five. I taught this concept at a seminar in Chicago one time, and I instructed the participants to practice empathic listening during the evening. The next morning, a man came up to me almost bursting with news. Let me tell you what happened last night, he said. I was trying to close a big commercial real estate deal while I was here in Chicago. I met with the principals, their attorneys, and another real estate agent who had just been brought in with an alternative proposal. It looked as if I was going to lose the deal. I had been working on this deal for over six months, and in a very real sense, all my eggs were in this one basket. All of them. I panicked. I did everything I could. I pulled out all the stops. I used every sales technique I could. The final stop was to say, could we delay this decision just a little longer? But the momentum was so strong, and they were so disgusted by having this thing go on so long, it was obvious they were going to close. So I said to myself, well, why not try it? Why not practice what I learned today and seek first to understand, then to be understood? I've got nothing to lose. I just said to the man, let me see if I really understand what your position is and what your concerns about my recommendations really are. When you feel I understand them, then we'll see whether my proposal has any relevance or not. I tried, oops, lost my spot. I tried to put myself in his shoes. I tried to verbalize his needs and concerns and he began to open up. The more I sensed and expressed the things he was worried about, the results he anticipated, the more he opened up. Finally, in the middle of our conversation, he stood up, walked over to the phone, and dialed his wife. Putting his hand over the mouthpiece, he said, You've got the deal. I was totally dumbfounded, he told me. I still am, this morning. He had made a huge deposit in the emotional bank account by giving the man psychological air. When it comes right down to it, other things being relatively equal, the human dynamic is more important than the technical dimensions of the deal. Seeking first to understand, diagnosing before you prescribe, is hard. It's so much easier in the short run to hand someone a pair of glasses that have fit you so well these many years. But in the long run, it severely depletes both P and PC. You can't achieve maximum interdependent production from an inaccurate understanding of where other people are coming from. And you can't have interpersonal PC, high emotional bank accounts, if the people you relate with do, do not really feel understood. Empathic listening is also risky. It takes a great deal of security to go into a deep listening experience because you open yourself up to be influenced. You become vulnerable. It's a paradox in a sense because in order to have influence, you have to be influenced. That means you have to really understand that's why habits one, two, and three are so foundational. They give you the changeless inner core, the principal center from which you can handle the more outward vulnerability with peace and strength. And the next part is diagnose before you prescribe. Although it's risky and difficult, seek first to understand or diagnose before you prescribe. 
is a correct principle manifest in many areas of life. It's the mark of all true professionals. It's critical for the optimist. It's critical for the physician. Okay, it's critical for the, for the optometrist. Sorry. English. <laughs> you wouldn't have any confidence in a doctor's prescription unless you had confidence in the diagnosis. When our daughter Jenny was only two months old, she was sick one Saturday, the day of a football game in our community that dominated the consciousness of almost everyone. It was an important game. Some 60,000 people were there. Sandra and I would like to have gone, but we didn't want to leave Jenny. Her vomiting and diarrhea had us concerned. The doctor was at that game. He was not our personal physician, but he was the one on call. When Jenny's situation got worse, we decided we needed some medical advice. Sandra dialed the stadium and had him paged. It was right at a critical time in the game. And she could sense an official tone in his voice. Officious. O-F-F-I-C-I-O-U-S. Tone in his voice. Yes, he said briskly. What is it? This is Miss Covey, doctor, and we're concerned about our daughter, Jenny. What's the situation, he asked. Sandra described the symptoms, and he said, okay, I'll call in a prescription. Which is your pharmacy? When she hung up, Sandra felt that in her rush, she hadn't really given him full data, but that what she had told him was adequate. Do you think he realizes that Jenny is just a newborn? I asked her. I'm sure he does, Sandra replied. But he's not our doctor. He's never even treated her. Well, I'm pretty sure he knows. Are you willing to give her the medicine unless you're absolutely sure he knows? Sandra was silent. What are we going to do, she finally said. Call him back, I said. You call him back, Sandra replied. So I did. He was paged out of the game once again. Doctor, I said, when you called in that prescription, did you realize that Jenny is just two months old? No, he exclaimed. I didn't realize that. It's good you called me back. I'll change the prescription immediately. If you don't have confidence in the diagnosis, you won't have confidence in the prescription. This principle is also true in sales. An effective salesperson first seeks to understand the needs, the concerns, the situation of the customer. The amateur salesman sells products. The professional sells solutions to needs and problems. It's a totally different approach. The professional learns how to diagnose, how to understand, he also learns how to relate people's needs to his products and services. And he has to have the integrity to say, my product or service will not meet that need, if it will not. Diagnosing before you prescribe is also fundamental to law. The professional lawyer first gathers the facts to understand the situation to understand the law and precedents before preparing a case. A good lawyer almost writes the opposing attorney's case before he writes his own. It is also true in product design. Can you imagine someone in a company saying, this consumer research stuff is for the birds. Let's design products. In other words, forget understanding the consumer's buying habits and motives. Just design products. It would never work. A good engineer will understand the forces, the stresses at work, before designing the bridge. A good teacher, 
will assess the class before teaching. A good student will understand before he applies. A good parent will understand before evaluating or judging. The key to good judgment is understanding. By judging first, a person will never fully understand. Seek first to understand is a correct principle evident in all areas of life. It's a generic common denominator principle, but it has its greatest power in the area of interpersonal relations. Stop there. I think this next section is a little long. Two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six more pages, and I don't know if I can get that in. It has a lot of dialogue. We'll give it a try. Four autobiographical responses. Because we listen autobiographically, we tend to respond in one of four ways. We evaluate, we either agree or disagree, we probe, we ask questions from our own frame of reference, we advise, we give counsel based on our own experience, or we interpret. We try to figure people out, to explain their motives, their behavior, based on our own motives and behavior. These responses come naturally to us. We are deeply scripted in them. We live around models of them all the time. But how do they affect our ability to really understand? If I'm trying to communicate with my son, can he feel free to open himself up to me? When I evaluate everything he says before he really explains it, am I giving him psychological error? And how does he feel when I probe? Probing is playing 20 questions. It's autobiographical. It controls and it invades. It's also logical. And the language of logic is different from the language of sentiment and emotion. You can play 20 questions all day and not find out what's important to someone. Constant probing is one of the main reasons parents do not get close to their children. How's it going, son? Fine. Well, what's been happening lately? Nothing. So what's exciting at school? Not much. And what are your plans for the weekend? I don't know. You can't get him off the phone talking with his friends, but all he gives you is one and two word answers. Your house is a motel where he eats and sleeps, but he never shares, never opens up. And when you think about it honestly, why should he? If every time he does open up his soft underbelly, you elephants stomp it with autobiographical advice. And I told you so's. We are so deeply scripted in these responses that we don't even realize when we use them. I have taught this concept to thousands of people in seminars across the country, and it never fails to shock them deeply as we role play empathic listening situations. And they finally begin to listen to their own typical responses. But as they begin to see how they normally respond and learn how to listen with empathy, they can see the dramatic results in communication. Too many seek first to understand becomes the most exciting the most immediately applicable of all the seven habits. Let's take a look at what well might be a typical communication between a father and his teenage son. Look at the father's words in terms of the four different responses 
we have just described. Boy, Dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. What's the matter, son? Probing. Well, you just can't see the benefits yet, son. Oh, no, no. It's totally impractical. I don't get a thing out of it. Well, you just can't see the benefits yet, son. I felt the same way when I was your age. I remember thinking what a waste some of the classes were. But those classes turned out to be the most helpful to me later on. Just hang in there. Give it some time. Advising. I've given it 10 years of my life. Can you tell me what good X plus Y is going to be to me as an auto mechanic? An auto mechanic? You've got to be kidding. Evaluating. No, I'm not. Look at Joe. He's quit school. He's working on cars. And he's making lots of money. Now that is practical. It may look that way now, but several years down the road... Joe's going to wish he'd stayed in school. You don't want to be an auto mechanic. You need an education to prepare you for something better than that. Advising. I don't know. Joe's got a pretty good setup. Look, son, have you really tried probing and evaluating? I've been in high school two years now. Sure, I've tried. It's just a waste. That is a highly respected school, son. Give them a little credit. Advising, evaluating. Well, the other guys feel the same way I do. Do you realize how many sacrifices your mother and I have made to get you where you are? You can't quit when you've come this far. Evaluating. I know you've sacrificed, Dad, but it's just not worth it. Look, maybe if you spent more time doing your homework and less time in front of the TV. More advising and evaluating. Look, Dad, it's just no good. <sighs> Never mind, I don't want to talk about this anyway. Obviously, his father was well-intended. Obviously, he wanted to help. But he, did he even begin to really understand? Let us look more carefully at the sun. Not just his words, but his thoughts and feelings expressed parenthetically below. In parentheses, there we go. And the possible effect of some of the dad's autobiographical responses. Boy, dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. And he means I want to talk with you to get your attention. What's the matter, son? Which means you're interested. Good. It is totally impractical. I don't get a thing out of it. And he means I've got a problem with school and I feel just terrible. Well, you just can't see the benefits yet, son. I felt the same way when I was your age. Dad means. Oh no, here comes chapter three of Dad's autobiography. This isn't what I want to talk about. I don't really care how many miles he had to trudge through the snow to school without any boots. I want to get to this problem. I remember thinking what a waste of some of the time some of the classes were. But those classes turned out to be the most helpful to me later on. Just hang in there. Give it some time. Dad means time won't solve my problem. I wish I could tell you. I wish I could just spit it out. I've given it 10 years of my life. Can you tell me what good X plus Y is going to do me as an auto mechanic? An auto mechanic? You've got to be kidding. He wouldn't like me if I were an auto mechanic. He wouldn't like me if I didn't finish school. I have to justify what I said. No, I'm not. Look at Joe. He's quit school. He's working on cars. And he's making lots of money. Now that is practical. It may look that way now. But several years down the road, Joe's going to wish he'd stayed in school. Oh boy, here comes lecture number 16 on the value of an education. You don't want to be an auto mechanic? 
How do you know that, Dad? Do you really have any idea what I want? You need an education to prepare you for something better than that. I don't know. Joe's got a pretty good setup. He's not a failure. He didn't finish school, and he's not a failure. Look, son, have you really tried? He means we're beating around the bush. Dad, if you would just listen, I really need to talk to you about something important. I've been in high school two years now. Sure, I've tried. It's just a waste. That is a highly respected school, son. Give them a little credit. Oh, great. Now we're talking credibility. I wish I could talk about what I want to talk about. Well, the other guys feel the same way I do. I have some credibility, too. I'm not a moron. Do you realize how many sacrifices your mother and I have made to get you where you are? Uh-oh, here comes the guilt trip. Maybe I am a moron. The school's great, mom and dad are great, and I'm a moron. You can't quit when you've come this far. I know you've sacrificed dad, but it's just not worth it. Which means you just don't understand. Look, maybe if you spent more time doing your homework and less time in front of the TV. That's not the problem, Dad. That's not it at all. I never, I'll never be able to tell you. I was dumb to even try. Look, Dad, it's just no good. Never mind. I don't want to talk about this anyway. Can you see how limited we are when we try to understand another person on the basis of words alone? Especially when... <laughs> We're looking at that person through our own glasses. Can you see how limiting our autobiographical responses are to a person who is genuinely trying to get us to understand his autobiography? autobiography. <laughs> you will never be able to truly step inside another person to see the world as he sees it until you develop the pure desire, the strength of personal character, and the positive emotional bank account, as well as the empathic listening skills to do it. The skills, the tip of the iceberg, of empathic listening involve four developmental stages. The first and least effective is to mimic content. This is a skill taught in active or reflective listening without the character and relationship base it is often insulting to people and causes them to close up. It is, however, a first stage skill because it at least causes you to listen to what's being said. Mimicking content is easy. You just listen to the words that come out of someone's mouth and you repeat them. You're hardly even using your brain at all. We're gonna read it now, mimicking content. Boy, Dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. You've had it? You think school is for the birds? You have essentially repeated back the content of what was being said. You haven't evaluated or probed or advised or inter interpreted. You've at least showed you're paying attention to his words. But to understand, you'll want to do more. The second stage of emphatic... Em is to rephrase the content. It's a little more effective, but it's still limited to the verbal communication. Boy, Dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. You don't want to go to school anymore? This time you've put his meaning into your own words. Now you're thinking about what he said, mostly with the left side, the reasoning, logical side of the brain. The third stage brings your right brain into operation. 
you reflect feeling. Boy, Dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. You're feeling really frustrated. Now, you're not paying as much attention to what he's saying as you are to the way he feels about what he's saying. The fourth stage includes both the second and the third. You rephrase the content and reflect the feeling. Boy, Dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. You're really frustrated about school. Frustration is the feeling. School is the content. They're using both sides of the brain to understand both sides of his communication. Now, what happens when you use fourth stage empathic listening skills is really incredible. As you authentically seek to understand, as you rephrase content and reflect feeling, you give him psychological air. You also help him work through his own thoughts and feelings. As he grows up in his confidence of your sincere desire to really listen and understand, the barrier between. Okay, the barrier between what's going on inside him and what's actually being communicated to your to you disappears. It opens the soul to soul flow. He's not thinking and feeling one thing and communicating another. He begins to trust you with his innermost tender feelings and thoughts. Boy, Dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. I want to talk with you to get your attention. You really feel frustrated about school. That's right. That's how I feel. I sure am. It's totally impractical. I'm not getting a thing out of it. You feel like school's not doing you any good. Let me think. Is that what I mean? Well, yeah, I'm just not learning anything that's going to help me. I mean, look at Joe. He's dropped out of school and he's working on cars. He's making money. Now that seems practical. You feel that Joe really has the right idea. Well, well, I guess he does in a way. He's really making money now. But in a few years, I bet he'll probably be ticked off at himself. You think Joe's going to feel he made the wrong decision? Oh, he's got to. Just look at what he's given up. I mean, if you don't have an education, you just can't make it in this world. Education is really important. Oh, yeah, I mean, if you don't have a diploma, if you can't get jobs or go to college, what are you going to do? You've just got to get an education. It's important to our, your future. It is. And you know what? I'm really worried. Listen, you won't tell mom, will you? You don't want your mother to find out? Well, not really. Okay, I guess you can tell her. She'll probably find out anyway. Look, I took this test today, and this reading test, and Dad, they said I'm reading on a fourth grade level. Fourth grade? I'm a junior in high school. What a difference real understanding can make. All the well-meaning advice in the world won't amount to a hill of beans if we're not even addressing the real problem. And we'll never get to the problem if we're so caught up in our own autobiography, our own paradigms, that we don't take off our glasses long enough to see the world from another point of view. I'm going to flunk, Dad. I guess I figure if I'm going to flunk, I might as well quit. But I don't want to quit. You feel torn. You're in the middle of a dilemma. What do you think I should do, Dad? Alright, we're going to stop there. We are on page 251. I've been reading to you Habit 5 from the 7 Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey. Thank you for being with me this morning. I appreciate you.